Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. It's great to be back after my trip to South America. I appreciate your prayers. And uh, next week, uh, before my message, I'll share a few slides and give you a little update on that. I know Oren uh, normally gives you the announcements. By the way, uh, speaking of announcements, don't we have a great worship team? Let's give them a hand of applause. And we have a new honorary member. Matthew uh, did the uh, slides for the um, lyrics of our hymns this morning. Normally that's Patrick's job, but he's in Taiwan, so Patrick needs to come back soon or he's going to lose his job. Um, but uh, Matthew did a fabulous job on that uh, this morning as well. But two quick announcements. Uh, we'd love to have you stay for lunch after the service today. Back in the Fellowship Hall, we have lots of wonderful food that's been prepared, and so if you don't have other plans... I know one family does, but if you don't have any other plans, please join us for lunch, a great time of fellowship. Also, week after next is Vacation Bible School, and so uh, we still have a lot of preparations to do, but uh, if you know a boy or girl, um, I believe preschool or school age up through, what, sixth grade, fifth grade, uh, through for, uh, one through six, and then we have preschool, are only for the workers. Okay, so basically... Uh, one through six grades, uh, please invite them, uh, offer to bring them, because we're going to have a wonderful time. And for those of you who didn't see me, I'm going to be dressed up as Dr. Frankenstein and so uh, and doing missions with our own Reagan Banaski for his last ministry in this church for a while. So it's going to be uh, a really fun time. So please uh, join us for that. Bring, bring a, a young person, and above all, pray for us in that time. Also, uh, as uh, I think most of you know, uh, we lost our darling uh, Leslie this week, uh, but heaven's gain and our loss, and so it's so uh, good to see, but sorry under these circumstances, a number of members of uh, Leslie's family here with us this morning, welcome, and I was uh, thrilled that our church could have a small uh, role of encouragement in your family this morning, so I'd like to just uh, have a, a couple of minutes of prayer for your family and some other needs in our church uh, as we begin. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Father, you are God, and we do not understand your ways, uh, but we accept your sovereignty and the things that you allow in life. And so, Father, I just pray that you would uh, show yourself to be God um, today and in coming days and weeks and months and years uh, to Leslie's family. Father, I specifically would pray for Fritz and Rossanne, for Abby. Uh, for their family, for their friends, Lord, that you would comfort them, that you would encourage them, that you would lift them up, give them strength each day. And Lord, as they grieve, uh, help them to sense a special um, nearness to you. Uh, Lord, help them to remember the many wonderful things uh, from Leslie's life and to know that we will be reunited with her very, very soon. I pray, Lord, especially for the many young people uh, who were at the funeral uh, yesterday. Father, the young pallbearers, the uh, friends from school, uh, the friends from work. Uh, Leslie was so popular. It's such a tribute to her life that uh, she uh, loved and was so outgoing. But I pray that those young people who heard the gospel yesterday, that many of them will begin a journey uh, to you, to your word, to walk with you, to come to know you. And so just, I just ask you to wrap their whole family and all their friends up in your arms, and our, comfort us as a church, too, in this, uh, this great loss, Lord. We know that uh, this is Leslie's first Sunday with you in heaven, and Lord, just as she was here, I know that she's uh, close to you there. Father, I would also pray for others in our congregation. I know that there are health needs. Lord, there are needs for healing of uh, various problems. I pray that you would uh, be the great healer, the great physician for them. Lord, for those in need of job or em employment, I pray that you would meet their needs financially and in terms of employment. Lord, for those who are struggling with any issue, Lord, discouragement, uh, trials in family, Lord, personally inside, whatever it would be, I pray again that you would show yourself to be God to them, to help them. And Lord, finally, I would pray that you would help all the workers and teachers and leaders that are preparing for Vacation Bible School, Lord, that you would give us your strength to reach out to boys and girls so that many of them could come to know the Lord Jesus at an early age as their Savior. And so now, Father, I pray that as we uh, go into our time of study in your Word, that you will uh, teach us through your Spirit, because the truth is you are our true teacher. 
And so use my words here this morning to encourage and instruct. And we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As you go out, if you did not get a bulletin, also there are some little remembrance cards of Leslie that are in the back. And I believe that uh, Ross and you all would love for anyone to take a remembrance of Leslie if you have not gotten one of those already. So uh, please uh, take one of those and use it as a, a prayer reminder uh, for the family, and just to rejoice in what the Lord has uh, done uh, in our lives. Most of you know that over the past few weeks, we have been uh, studying in the great book of Psalms in the Old Testament, and this was the prayer and praise book of both Israel and the church. And so far, we have studied three different Psalms, each of which deal with the Word of God. And so I'd like to use a little chart, as you know, I'm fond of using charts here to review uh, these different psalms. We studied in Psalm 1, and one thing I like to do is use symbols or pictures uh, to help us remember things. So if you can have in your mind the idea of a tree, that's a great symbol for Psalm 1, because the man of God, the woman of God who meditates on and obeys God's Word is like a tree planted by streams of water that is stable, that is bearing fruit. And so the image of a tree for Psalm 1. In Psalm 2, we looked at God's incarnate word, the King Jesus who will rule all nations when he returns a second time. And I think a fitting symbol for Psalm 2 is the scepter for Jesus who is the king of the world, but someday he will be returned to this planet and be rightfully proclaimed for what he is. Then we studied Psalm 19 before I went to Peru. Two symbols for that uh, great uh, psalm, the sun in the sky and a scroll like the Bible. The sun in the sky shows that God reveals himself generally in nature. We know general truths about God, that he is all-powerful, that he is all-knowing, other truths through nature, but we have to have God's specific revelation in Scripture to know details about him, such that he is uh, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that salvation is by grace through faith. Those are things we would not know from nature. We can know them, however, through Scripture. Today we come to the great psalm, 119. Two symbols, the lamp, which we will see in a later verse. God's Word gives us light to know and to obey God. But here's my favorite symbol for Psalm 119, the heart. Our heart for God's Word ultimately reveals our heart for God. Show me a guy who views the Bible, or show me a guy and how he views the Bible, and that's ultimately how that man views God himself. In coming weeks, as we study through this great psalm, we're going to see the full range of positive emotions, personal decisions that a believer can have as they feel and choose God's Word. No other psalm, no other chapter in the Bible so vividly portrays how much a person can love God by loving His Word. And so that's the title I've chosen this morning, Knowing, Loving, and Obeying God and his word. And so we'll look at the first 16 verses more in coming weeks. A couple of pictures here. On the left is a rabbi by the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, and he has his Hebrew Bible open to Psalm 119, uh, reading it there, uh, perhaps reciting it. Many of the rabbis have large portions of the Old Testament memorized. And then on the right, uh, have you ever seen a kid's picture Bible with all the pictures in it? That's nothing new. In the Middle Ages, this is a Latin manuscript, and notice the little illustrations on the side, the little birds, and then the pictures. One of the reasons why the church in the first 1,500 years of its existence put pictures on the walls and sculptures was because most people didn't know how to read. And so the manuscripts that had the illustrations, the pictures on the walls, the uh, sculptures were to help people who couldn't read because... In the first 1,500 years of the church, most people didn't own their own Bible either. The Bible was at the church building uh, or the cathedral. People didn't have their own copies. So how incredibly blessed we are that most of us are able to read. Most of us are able to own one or more Bibles. Of all Christians who ever lived, how blessed are we? The question, though, is what are we going to do with that wonderful book that God has given to us? For many years, as I traveled across the world, I preached evangelistically, presenting the gospel to people, and I said that there's only basically two options in world religions. First, there is religion, 
and I, you see I notice I have a little arrow pointing up. All man-made religions either try to find God or they try to find some substitute for God. That's a pretty good description of what world religions are about. But I always said true Christianity is a relationship. Biblical Christianity is a personal relationship with God. And notice the arrows go both ways, God to us, us to God. But you know, as I've studied the Bible over the years, I've come to a little bit different conclusion. There's a third R that needs to be here, and that is the word revelation. God's revelation of himself helps us to know him and to trust him. His revelation of his will enables us to obey him and to please him. And it is only through God's revelation of himself in the Bible and his will that ultimately you and I can have a relationship with God. Without God's revelation, there can be no relationship with God. And so the most important of these R's is revelation, and then based on the revelation, we can have a relationship with God. So what is Psalm 119 about? Well, I've looked at a number of different summaries uh, in different commentaries, and here's one that I think is very helpful. Uh, Psalm 119, of course, is the longest chapter in the Bible, and it's the longest of the Psalms with 176 verses. So here's how I would sum up this amazing psalm. Knowing, loving, and obeying God's Word keeps us from sin as believers, and it helps us to know and serve God in spite of two things, our own failings and the persecutions that always come when we attempt to live by God's Word and obey it. So every verse in Psalm 119 speaks either of God's Word or our response to His Word or both. And the chief response of the man who wrote this psalm was to pray over and over and over to God in light of what his word teaches. Now, before we actually look at some verses in Psalm 119, I'd like to share some things that I've learned that have helped me understand this great psalm. We're still in the introduction. Notice the picture here on the left. People have called a Psalm 119 the crown jewel of the book of Psalms, but really it is 176 little jewels that are woven together in a tapestry or a mosaic. And so in most cases, if you see a tapestry, this amazing piece of cloth woven, or you see a mosaic, you have to stand back to be able to get the the big picture of it. But Psalm 119 is different. Rather than standing back, we have to come up close and look at every one of those 176 verses to notice the great details that are in this psalm. Unfortunately, because there's so many verses, and I only can cover it in a few weeks, we can't dive into every word and every verse like I would like to. But we'll try to dive in where we can uh, with some specifics, and then also stand back and look more at the general picture as we can. I want us to go back, (coughs) excuse me, for a moment to Psalm 1 and see its relationship to uh, Psalm 119. Let's review this again. We preached Psalm 1 a few weeks ago. How happy or blessed is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of sinners or join a group of mockers. Instead, this man, this woman's delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. So, Psalm 1 tells us there's two basic things that the godly person does. Delight in God's Word, the Bible, and meditate on it. When we come to Psalm 119, we find 176 specific ways that we can carry out this delighting and meditating on the Word. So Psalm 1 gives us the general principle And 119 gives us many applications and illustrations how we do that. Or to put it in other words, let's change slides. Psalm 1, or Psalm 119, is what it looks like to put Psalm 1 into practice. Or Psalm 1 is the acorn, and Psalm 119 is the oak tree. Only, of course, this oak tree, you've got to climb it and look at some of the leaves and some of the branches up close. And again, We'll try to do as much of a balance as we can between the leaves, the acorns, uh, the limbs, as well as trying to get a picture of the tree as a whole. One more thing before we look at the psalm itself. Psalm 119 is arranged 
in special order in Hebrew, called an acrostic. There's 22 stanzas in Psalm 119, eight verses per stanza. All eight verses in each stanza begin with successive letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Now, in English, if we had an acrostic of a poem with successive alphabet letters every eight verses, it would look like this. Verses 1 to 8, all would begin with the letter A. Now, this is English now. Verses 9 to 16, all begin with the letter B. 17 to 24, all begin with C. 25 to 32, all begin with D, all through the alphabet. Of course, we have, what, 26 letters in our alphabet? Hebrew only has 22 letters in their alphabet. So that's the way the psalm is arranged. So the question is, why did God allow this psalmist to use a structure which seems to many people very uh, difficult? Uh, It seems sort of artificial. But if they looked at some of our poems where the words rhyme at the end, they might think that's kind of artificial too. So, you know, it's just a difference of culture. It's a difference of perspective. And even in the world today, we have so many wonderful cultures over the world and so many different ways of looking at things. Certainly, we can allow the people in the Bible a little bit different way culturally of looking at things. But why did God do this? Well, let's go to the New Testament, to the last book, and look at Psalm uh, Revelation 22, what Jesus said. Remember, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and Omega, first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, Alpha, and then down here, Omega, the first and last letters, the first and the last, the beginning of the end. Now, what did Jesus mean when he said he was the Alpha and the Omega? Did he mean he was just the first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet? I think what he was really saying was he was the first letter, the last letter, and all the letters in between. Jesus, we'd say in English, is the whole alphabet, A to Z. Jesus is everything to me. He's everything to you. There is no need in our lives that Jesus cannot meet. And just as he runs the whole gamut of the letters, he runs the whole gamut of our experience in life. So that whatever we face each day, Jesus is there for us as Christians to be able to meet that need. Well, in a similar way, Psalm 119, because it has all the letters, starting with Aleph, of the, and of course you read right to left in Hebrew, we read left to right in Greek and English, but in Hebrew you read right to left, starting with Aleph all the way down to Tav, which is the last letter of their alphabet. In the same way, Psalm 119 covers every letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And again, God is basically telling us He is covering every possible aspect of our experience in this life. There is nothing that the Bible does not cover. There is nothing that the Bible doesn't deal with. Not necessarily the specifics, but no need will ever come along in life that the Bible does not address that. And that's one of the big things that Psalm 119, 19 is dealing with. Just like the alphabet covers every letter of the language, Psalm 119, and the Bible as a whole covers every need that we will ever have. Now, let me ask you, is that how you view the Bible? Do you view the Bible as just some ancient book that's been handed down to us, like uh, some of the ancient books from different nations? Or is it really God's Word that because He inspired it, it really can speak to us? in whatever happens to us in life, from our youth to midlife to old age. And again, this is why our study here on Sunday mornings of the Bible and our own personal study of the Bible in our own time at home is so critical. Because unless we know what the Bible teaches, unless we learn it, how are we going to know how to apply it when the circumstances of life come along to show us what we need to learn? So before we go into the text itself, let me show you one more picture. I've had a number of pastors write me from over across the world on how they could learn Greek and Hebrew. If you have some interest, it's not hard. I mean, if I could learn it, anybody could learn it. But here, do you like bingo? Well, here is a cool, of course, not for money, but, uh, but here's you can play bingo with the letters. Here's Alpha and Omega with the free space here of the Greek alphabet. So what a fun way to learn the language. And also, for centuries, kids have been studying these languages. Today, I'm very glad to know that many homeschooling families uh, teach Greek, Hebrew, and sometimes Latin. But for centuries, the Wesley brothers, for example, Susanna with 16 kids and all the housework that she had, if you can imagine a family that size, 
taught her children Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, along with English and other things. So it can be done. But here, first letter we're going to look at today, the letter Aleph in Hebrew, Are, which is the word for lion in Hebrew, begins with this first letter. It's not A, but it's, it's a silent letter. Second letter of the alphabet in Hebrew is Beit, just like our letter B. It's basically our letter B, but that's the word for house. You remember the city where Jesus was born, Bethlehem? That's basically the Hebrew word Beit Lechem, the house of bread, which, if you remember in the book of Ruth, becomes very significant that uh, both for what Bethlehem isn't in the beginning and then what it is later. So, uh, and then next week we're going to look at the letter uh, Gimel, which is the word in Hebrew for camel. So for, if children can do this, certainly um, we can have some fun with it too. So after a very long introduction, let's go ahead and look at the first 16 verses of Psalm 119. Uh, beginning with the first verse. And again, this is the letter Aleph, first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And in Hebrew, every single one of these verses begins with the letter Aleph. How happy are those whose way is blameless, who live according to God the Lord's instruction. Happy are those who keep his decrees and seek him with all their heart. Remember how close this is to Psalm 1. Happy or blessed are those who keep, are those who obey. So there's, again, a parallel between how Psalm 1 begins and how Psalm 119 begins. I don't think that's by accident. Verse 3, they do nothing wrong. They follow in his ways. We'll come back to verse 3 in a minute and talk about that phrase, they do nothing wrong. You have commanded that your precepts be diligently kept. And notice he's talking to the Lord in all these verses. Every time you see the word you... He are your, he's talking to the Lord. It's a prayer. If only my ways were committed to keeping your statutes, then I would not be ashamed when I think about all your commands. I will praise you with a sincere heart. When I learn your righteous judgments, I will keep your statutes, never abandon me. Let's hold on this one just for a second uh, before we go forward. Notice that as we look at this, If only my ways were committed, he says, then I would not be ashamed. The writer of this psalm is admitting to God, confessing to God, that he doesn't live up to this ideal 100% that he's presented in the first verses. That's the goal. That is what he is aiming towards, but his life falls far short of it, and so he confesses that. But his goal at the end is he makes a vow I will praise you when I learn. I will keep your statutes. And when he says here at the end, never abandon me, the psalmist isn't afraid that God is going to send him to hell. He is basically saying, I cannot keep this word, Lord, unless you are with me. This is the very same prayer that you and I should pray. Lord, I cannot live the Christian life. I cannot do your will in my life unless you help me. That is why it is so important to first know what God wants us to do through a study of the Word, or we're not going to have the information we need to live for Him. Now the next stanza. And again, the letter Beit, or B, begins every single one of these verses in the Hebrew original. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your Word. A very famous memory verse that many young people, I memorized that in the King James when I was very, very young, and it's a verse that has stuck with me all of my life. Verse 10, I have sought you with all my heart. Don't let me wander from your commands. Do you see a tension there? His desire is and his experience has been, Lord, I've given you my all. I've sought you with everything I have, and yet don't let me wander. Don't let me be like a sheep that strays away, uh, off the path. Then verse 11, another famous memory verse that many children and adults have learned. I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Again, a verse that I memorized in the King James when I was a child. Verse 12, Lord, may you be praised. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I proclaim all the judgments from your mouth. 
I rejoice in the way revealed by your decrees, as much as in all riches. Verse 14, is that how you view the Bible as one of your most valuable possessions? If your house were on fire and you could only had time to take out a few things, would you think to take a Bible? Well, of course, in our society, sadly, we have so many Bibles, you know, our thought would be, well, we can buy another one. But suppose that you only had one Bible. It might be one of the things that you would rescue in a fire. And that's, I think, what he's saying here. Lord, take everything else I've got, but don't take your word away. And, of course, the stories from China and from many countries of people. I have heard and read stories from China during the years before the Bible was printed there. Praise God that now in mainland China, they are printing Bibles. But in the years when it was completely prohibited to print Bibles, I read of a couple that when they got married, they sold all their wedding gifts to buy a portion of the Bible so they could study it. What a wonderful marriage that Christian couple must have to have put the Word of God as the foundation of their marriage from the wedding forward. Another man I heard in China sold his blood by the pint to get the money to buy verses from the Bible. Would you sell your blood to get verses from the Bible if you didn't have anything else in the Bible? And so in light of that, how blessed are we to have stacks of Bibles in our homes, stacks of Bibles here in our church. And as I've said in other sermons, we may not always be so blessed because we're going to look at in coming weeks. When persecution starts, one of the first books that gets banned is the Word of God. And I believe with all my heart, if the Lord Jesus does not come back soon, we will live to see a day in here in America where the Bible will be banned because it's the most dangerous book in the world to anyone who disagrees with it, of course. And so we need to use the time that we have while we have it. There are four promises or vows that this man makes in these last two verses. I will meditate on your precepts. Again, going back to Psalm 1. I will think about your ways. I will delight in your statutes. Again, notice the two key verbs that take us back to Psalm 1, delight and meditate, and I will not forget your word. How will he not forget it? By learning it, by memorizing it. Now, there is a major theological issue, doctrinal issue, staring us in the face. And if I was like many preachers, I would just sort of gloss over it and let you go home and chew on it on your own. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hit it right between the eyes. And that's one of the reasons why God is using the messages from here across the world in a way that's encouraging people. Look again at the first three verses. How happy are those whose way is blameless, who live according to the Lord's instruction. Happy are those who keep His decrees and seek Him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They follow in His steps. That first part of verse 3, does that sound like anybody you know? I'm afraid it doesn't sound much like Frank. Um, But then look at verse 5, as we said earlier. He recognizes that he doesn't live up to this. If only my ways were committed to keeping your statutes. And again, verse 10, I've sought you with all my heart, but yet don't let me wander. So there is this tension going on between the way you can live as a believer and the way he sees his own experience. Well, if you think this is unique to the Old Testament, it gets more intense in the New Testament. Let's look at one of the the first letter of the Apostle John, John 1, verse 6. He says, If we say as Christians we have fellowship with God and yet walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. Cleansing is possible for our sins as Christians. Verse 8, If we say we have no sin... We are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And then another verse that's very helpful to commit to memory, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous or just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then, just in case you didn't get it, verse 10. If we say we don't have any sin, we make him a liar, 
and his word is not in us. So based on these verses, it could not be any clearer. We Christians do sin. We shouldn't, but we do. But God has provided a way for us to be cleansed from our sins when we fail. And if we dare to say as a Christian that we haven't sinned, that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and we're calling God a liar. So this much is clear. Now, this is the easier part. Now let's go to chapter 3. 1 John 3, beginning in verse 6. Everyone who remains in him, key word remains, does not sin. Everyone who sins has not seen him or known him. Little children addressed to believers, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he, Jesus, is righteous. But the one who commits sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. And then verse 9, everyone who has been born of God does not sin key phrase which we don't have time to look at, because his seed remains in him, he is not able to sin because he has been born of God. Wow. How do we balance 1 John chapter 1 with 1 John chapter 3? How do we balance the verses that we looked at in Psalm 119? Well, that's why we do theology. That's why we balance Scripture with Scripture in careful study so that we're doing equal justice to what all the parts of God's Word say. But if you look at the last 2,000 years of church history, if you look at the different denominations of the church today across the world, you realize people try to solve this problem in different ways. And by the way, the slides are deliberately off because I wanted to speak to you and not have you distracted by the slides for a, a little bit. So how do people solve this tension? Many different solutions, and I'm always honest with you. I will fail you in many ways, but I'm not going to fail you by failing to be honest. Some people solve this tension by just saying, they just throw up their hands. The Bible contradicts itself. There is no reconciliation of these truths. But that's not possible because the Bible teaches in many places that it is without error. When God speaks, he can't make a mistake, he can't lie. So the Bible is absolutely true, so it, there can't be a contradiction here. So that's, that is a solution that we have to just throw out at the very start. Then other people uh, try to solve this by swinging the pendulum one way or the other, theologically, but if you go too far in one side, too far in the other, you get into error. I'll give you a couple of examples. If you take Psalm 119, verse 3, they do nothing wrong. If you take 1 John 3, 9, he is not able to sin. If you take that too far to one side, you're going to end up in a teaching of many churches and denominations. It's called sinless perfection are perfectionism. Those groups teach that a Christian, here and now, can become perfect, totally and completely sinless, permanently, this side of heaven. Well, 1 John 1 very carefully contradicted that. That is not the case. We can never become permanently sinless in this life. That's why we need a glorified body, glorified mind at the coming of Christ, so that we will have a body, a mind, a spirit fit to be in the presence of God forever. So that's not a solution. But then there's people who swing to the opposite side, which is an, also an error. Some groups teach that we Christians, we're forgiven, but we are so sinful, we're so fallen, we're so prone to wander that we can't help but sin. Sin is unavoidable. We might as well resign ourselves to it. As one famous guy said, and I won't tell you who he is here, I'll tell you at lunch if you want to know, he said, sin bravely, because you can't help it. Well, that's also false. The Scripture teaches that we never have to sin as Christians. God always provides us a way out, whether it's a temptation, whatever it is. God's Spirit lives within us, and we always have the ability to do what is right. So it's only fair for you to ask, Frank, how do you solve this? Well, I don't have the final answer, but let me just tell you what I understand at this point in my life. If we are truly born-again believers, then we Christians have the Holy Spirit permanently living in us. The Bible says we are new creatures. We are new beings. We have a new nature or a new capacity to do good. Plus, we have the Word of God as our guide and our lamp. We have everything we need any moment any hour, any day, to obey and do God's will and His Word, if we will depend upon Him to control us. 
And in that moment that we are obeying, in that hour, those minutes, however long it is, we're doing God's will and we are sinless. However, the challenge is we got to keep on doing that. we got to remain consistent. And that's where our weaknesses, our frailty, our temptations, our habits, our distractions come in. So we can climb the mountain and we can arrive temporarily, but boy, just around the corner we can fall off the other side. But just as quickly as we fall off, what did 1 John 1 tell us? God has provided a way to cleanse us for us to pick ourselves back up in repentance, in confession, in cleansing, and get back in the race. So we have this tension. So let's look at uh, Psalm 119.9 verses some. I believe that 119 verse 9 is the Old Testament parallel to 1 John 1 verses 7 and 9. 119.9 says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word. The New Testament version of that we looked at, so important, I want to read it again. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, what does it look like? this back and forth, this tension in someone's life. Well, I'm going to go, to go briefly to one of the most famous guys in the Bible, and you all know him, Simon Peter. Let's look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Jesus says, I've been with you about three years. Who do people say that I am? And so the disciples said, some say John the Baptist, who had died, and they thought he had been resurrected as Jesus. Others, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Probably the most important question that you'll ever have to answer. Who is Jesus? And Simon Peter, always (laughs) the first to speak up, which was his blessing and his curse, you are the Messiah the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what did Jesus say? Jesus responded, Simon, son of Jonah, you are blessed because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. No person can say that unless God enables them to say it and understand it. And Peter was the first to say it. A revelation from God the Father, not the Holy Spirit now. This is God the Father speaking through Peter. But then let's look what happened to poor old Peter just a short time later. Verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and be raised on the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh, no, Lord. That must never happen to you. You can't go to the cross. You can't think about dying. But he turned and told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me because you are not thinking about God's concerns but man's. Whoa. Imagine having Jesus say that to you. Get behind me, Satan. So you realize what's happened here? One moment, Peter was speaking God's own words, God the Father, a revelation from God the Father that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. The next minute's Peter is a mouthpiece for the devil, saying, don't go to the cross. You don't need to do that salvation thing. Go ahead and make yourself king. You know, if I look honestly into my own heart, and if you look into your own heart, you will be honest. This isn't just Peter. That's Frank. That's you. Consistent victory, brothers and sisters, friends, is possible in the Christian life. We can go... For however long without sinning, God has given us everything we need to do that, but not permanently, not till we die. And that's why if we're going to ever achieve God's will for our lives, we have to be serious about a study of Scripture. How is it that Peter won this victory? He won it through what he said, but how is it that he lost the battle? Through what he said. And what made the difference? what God said. Brothers and sisters, the more that we can make what we say what God says, the more we will live like God wants us to live. And the more we go off half-tracked saying our own thing, and I do it every day, 
you know, the more we're going to get into trouble. And that's why we come here and make God's Word the centerpiece of this church, just like Lafayette Bible Chapel, the Bible is the heart of our name, the Scriptures are the heart of our ministry here on Sunday mornings. And so that God can gradually transform our minds, our words, our conduct, so that we can achieve however long God's will for our lives. Okay, I know that's been very heavy, so we're going to go a little bit lighter and faster to finish up. I want to uh, conclude today with five simple applications of how you can take Psalm 119, put it into practice in your life, and then next week we'll go full tilt into verses 17 and following. First, start memorizing verses in Psalm 119. Two to start with, verse 9, how can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word. Verse 11, I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. Memorize it in any version you want, NIV, New American Standard, King James, New King James, just do it. John Ruskin, this guy here with the, that needs a beard trim, John Ruskin was a writer, but he was not a minister, he was not a theologian. He lived in the 19th century, and his mother was a strict Calvinist, and boy, she made everybody in the house line up straight. And she made poor old John, poor old John, as a boy, memorize many, many portions of Scripture, including many psalms, including Psalm 119, all 176 verses. This very staunch Calvinistic lady made him memorize it. Here's what he said later in life when he had the beard. It is strange that of all the pieces of the Bible which my mother taught me, which that which cost me the most to learn and which was to my childish mind chiefly repulsive, The 119th Psalm has now become the most precious thing to me in its overflowing and glorious passion of love for the Word of God. He hated it when he was a child to memorize it, but he learned to thank God that his mother had made him memorize that long psalm because of all of them, the one that seemed to be the worst ended up being the best. Second, Use Psalm 119 to confess your own sins or to ask God to keep you from sinning. Again, three verses. If only my ways were committed to keeping your statutes, a heart's desire. Then I would not be ashamed when I think about all your commands. I have sought you with all my hearts, with all my heart rather. Don't let me wander from your commands. There's a famous story in English history, that's why I have the gallows here, about how a condemned man used Psalm 119 to escape his execution. His name was George Wishart, not the famous martyr who died under Henry VIII, but another George Wishart much later. He was condemned to be hanged in London. He was a guilty man. But there was a custom at the time that the condemned person on the gallows could have the parson or the bishop or whoever read a passage of Scripture. So, uh, Wishart may have been uh, broken the law, but he knew what was the longest psalm of the Bible. So he picked Psalm 119, and it took so, so, so long to read it that the king sent a pardon before the execution. So he was able to buy time through this song. So you say that's kind of crafty, but the irony is that he got a pardon accidentally just because of time. But you and I can get God's daily pardon. As we look at Psalm 119, as we look at all of Scripture and confess our sins, as we study it and meditate on it. So what this guy did by craft, by nook or crook, boy, we need to do deliberately. And so what a, what a great lesson sort of in reverse. Three, if you're a beginning Bible student, let me encourage you, don't just read the Bible, learn to study the Bible. There's so many, many wonderful little booklets and courses Or start with one of the easier books of the Bible, Ruth or Jonah or the Gospel of Mark. If you are an advanced Bible student and you already study the Bible regularly, why don't you beef up your Bible study in an area that you need some practice in, an area that you have never tried before? Do you know that the book of 1 John, a lot of people say, oh, it's easy because most of the words are one syllable. Eh, Ain't so. 1 John is one of the hardest books of the Bible. So try that one. Or 2 Peter or Job, or the Song of Songs, or Hosea, Ezekiel, if you want uh, a marathon. Psalm 119 is actually one of the hardest of all the psalms. But try something you've never tried before if you're an advanced student, and watch God bless you as you not only study it, but you put it into practice. Number four, keep a journal or a diary. Record how you're doing each day, obeying or disobeying God. 
be, be careful to re- record both your victories as well as your failures. Be specific. Ask a prayer partner to pray for you in areas that you're writing down where you're struggling. See, a journal's not going to lie if you're honest with it. And that way it can be a very helpful tool to help you pinpoint areas of your life. You need to grow. Plus, it can be a great encouragement if you look back and you say, man, on Tuesday, on Monday, I had this great victory. God was with me. It'll encourage you to live the same on Friday or Saturday or Sunday. William Wilberforce was a British statesman who was largely responsible for the abolition of the slave trade throughout the empire. In 1819, he wrote in his journal, he kept a journal, I was walking today through Hyde Park Corner, repeating the 119th Psalm in great comfort. Now, do you think it's very unusual that a man who was so involved in politics, so involved in his country, so involved in a world cause like abolishing slavery, that he had time to have memorized Psalm 119, and that on just a walk through the park, he would recite it. And then he recorded what he did in his journal. See, the journal revealed what was going on in his life. And again, if a man like this, so very, very busy, could, could learn the whole thing, we can learn a few verses. Finally, pray the first two stanzas that we've looked at this morning, line by line this coming week. Meditate on each line and consider what action you could take to obey it. If we're going to live up to the ideals of this psalm, we must grow in our commitment over time, putting away distractions, habits, the tyranny of the urgent. The battle's not going to be won in a day, but God can help us to grow in godliness and Christ-likeness over time. Many people don't realize that this guy here on the left, one of our most famous founders, Patrick Henry, He didn't just start out to be the greatest orator of the American Revolution. He had to grow into that. Old Patrick started out as a farmer. He never went to college, but in six weeks, he studied enough law books to be eligible to to apply for the bar in Virginia. As a self-taught attorney, over the course of his career, Henry tried over a thousand court cases, and he won most of them. But he didn't have a law degree like most of the other attorneys. By the time the British passed the Stamp Act in 1765, this self-educated speaker appealed to the Magna Carta so many, many centuries before, and he unleashed his fiery rhetoric against the crown for their violation of the colonists' rights. But it was only after many years of preparation that he was ready to utter the words that he will always be remembered for, give me liberty or give me death. And just as he did not grow into this kind of oratory overnight, so you and I, brothers and sisters, can't grow into the kind of Christian life we've looked at overnight. It has to be a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly study of development. And that's why we come together here so we can encourage each other in that incredible task that will make all the difference not only in our lives, but in the lives of people that we will touch. And this church is touching people around the world. So do not sell Lafayette Bible Chapel short, as well as folks right here in the city of Lafayette. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your wonderful word, and I pray that this week we would take to heart what we have heard here through your word this morning, and Lord, that we would take the Christian life seriously, that we really would seek, Lord, to spend minutes, hours serving you and not sinning against you. But when we do, Father, thank you that you have graciously, graciously supplied a way for us to be cleansed, forgiven, and get back in the race. Bless us this week. Help us now as we go to our lunch uh, and have a good time of fellowship, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.